In 1939, Germany was under the spell of a charismatic madman. His goal, world domination. German scientists were the first to split the atom, putting them one step closer to a bomb that could win the war in one terrible explosion. Pitted against them, a hand-picked group of scientists worked feverishly together to win the race to be the first to build an atomic bomb. It would take 1,000 days to develop the weapon that finally brought an end to the war. Told by the men and women who lived through them, this is their story. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him, takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. It was an amazing time, and it really is an amazing story, that you have the best scientists of their generation, experimentalists and theorists, um, all collected in one place in this secret laboratory on top of a desert mesa, dedicated to doing one thing, to building a weapon that will be decisive in winning the war. I mean, if you wrote this as a novel, uh, you, you couldn't do any better. Mankind had harnessed the essential power of the universe, nuclear fission, but how would we use it? Politicians and the men fighting the war wanted the ultimate weapon as fast as it could be produced. But only the scientists truly understood the danger and power soon to be unleashed. The Allies knew the Germans were already working on a bomb and that Hitler wouldn't hesitate to use it. It really is true that the people at Los Alamos were motivated by a fear that uh, Hitler was going to get the bomb first. Well, it's, you can say it's fear, concern, legitimate concern. They were the leaders in that field of research. I do not believe that people today realize how tremendous those dangers have been because Hitler indeed could have taken over. The world. Yes, there was a fear that it, it might not, you know, forces of good might not prevail. It just led a sense of urgency to what we were trying to do. Things were not going very well in the Pacific. We weren't really geared up at the beginning for this type of action. In the early days of World War II, there was no country in the world better poised to build a nuclear weapon than Hitler's Germany. Germany seemed unstoppable, yet all was not lost. Thanks to Albert Einstein's breakthrough, quantum leaps were being made, and the awesome power at the core of an atom was now under man's control. I suppose it all goes back maybe to Einstein. And we have the famous equation, E equals mc squared. Showed that very small amount of mass may be converted into a very large amount of energy. And they located that uranium would be the mass that could turn into an enormous amount of energy. The scientists understood only too well the threat the Nazis represented. Remember, many of these scientists had come from Europe and had studied with uh, the best scientists in the world, which at that point were in Germany, people like Werner Heisenberg and others. After Hitler came to power and drove many of them to uh, American shores, they feared what was going on back in, uh, in Europe. And uh, I think this initial fear was, was real, and uh, it was an obsession. Many top physicists had fled Germany, but some of the field's best and brightest were still working there, including the brilliant Werner Heisenberg. Dr. Leo Szilard was one of the refugees. In 1933, he had been the first to theorize a nuclear chain reaction. He knew the Germans were working on a bomb and drafted a letter to President Roosevelt warning him of the project. He took it to Einstein, who signed the letter and sent it off. A concerned Roosevelt responded, What you are after is to see that the Nazis don't blow us up. 
This requires action. The action he demanded came to be known as the Manhattan Project. The war in Europe raged on. Then on December the 7th, 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. The whole country was united. I, I lost a lot of friends during the early parts of the war. High school friends, college friends, most of them in the Pacific. The war was not going well. Britain was just hanging on by a thread. And we didn't have very much that we could do in the way of help. I think there was really a sense that we might not make it. Anything that they could do to bring an end to that slaughter, even with a terrible weapon would be to the good. So we had a real objective to end the war any way we could. On January the 9th, 1942, President Roosevelt officially authorized the project. Its mission, to build a bomb that would end the war. And so they choose Army Corps of Engineers because this is going to be done on an industrial scale instead of a university laboratory, which is where it was at the time. And uh, to hide it from Congress, they don't want Congress snooping around here. Congress tried every way on earth to get in here and the other laboratories. Groves kept them out completely. The man chosen to lead the project was a hard-nosed West Point graduate Leslie Groves. As head of the Manhattan District during the war, I was responsible for the development of the atomic bomb. General Groves was chosen to head the Manhattan Project in September of 1942. He was well prepared to do so, having been in charge of all mo Army mobilization for the run-up to World War II. Groves wasted no time ramping the Manhattan Project up to full speed. Soon after getting the job, in the first day or two, he goes to the Office of War Production, uh, to the head of it, a guy named Nelson, with a letter to himself, only needing Nelson's signature. And the letter directs Nelson to give Groves anything he needed. Nelson is shocked by this. At this point, Groves is still a colonel. And Nelson says, well, I can't do that. Um, and Groves says, well, I guess I'm going to have to tell President Roosevelt. Nelson is uh, shocked at this threat and says, OK, I'll sign the letter. Lacking the authority he needed to wield, Colonel Groves lobbied for promotion to general. New Groves quite well, probably New Groves better than almost anybody at Los Alamos. You could not have gotten anyone who could have pushed that project through faster. He was very, very good about that. I mean, it was as simple as in our cases, we wanted, initially we wanted one B-29. He got us a B-29 when they were being produced. We got one of the first ones off the line. Perhaps Grove's most inspired decision was appointing J. Robert Oppenheimer, scientific director of the Manhattan Project. We've got two cultures here. We've got the culture of the military and we've got the culture of science. One is closed and classified, one is open and declassified. But here he meets Oppenheimer and he sees that Oppenheimer thinks like him. He was a brilliant fellow. Groves could learn from other scientists that he was really very good. I mean, he was not only sounded brilliant, but he also had the physics to back it up, and uh, I think he recognized the qualities of a leader, which he had. Oppenheimer, oppie to those who knew him, was a controversial choice. Uh, Oppenheimer is someone who hasn't won a Nobel Prize. Others thought that he was not a good candidate for this job. Uh, Louis Alvarez, another physicist, said that you know, this is a man who couldn't run a hot dog stand, and yet he's going to run the most complex, uh, technically complex, and arguably most important uh, project for the war effort. He could be somewhat arrogant at times. I mean, some people were bothered by this. I was surprised and pleased. Oppenheimer was a difficult human being, but this was not so at Los Alamos. He was extremely intelligent, extremely quick, 
he was much too quick for me. I think it's still not quite understood what um, Groves saw in Oppenheimer, but I think you have to say that Groves was an excellent judge of character and of talent. I think Oppenheimer's real contribution was in managing all these uh, prima donna chairman of physics department, chemistry departments throughout the country. With a director in place, it was time to find somewhere to work, a place where secrecy and security could be guaranteed. When the project was first proposed, all of the atomic work that was going on in the United States was going on in, in universities like Berkeley and Chicago and MIT. And Groves did not want a lot of communications going on between the scientists. He didn't want those to get intercepted by the Nazis, and so he wanted to bring everybody together in one spot. He did not want the laboratory to be on a coast because he was afraid of, of naval bombardment or, or you know, some sort of attack. So he wanted it to be in the center of the country, and he wanted it to be very isolated. Robert Oppenheimer had grown up in New York City, and he was never a particularly strong young man, and his family had means, and so he and his brother Frank were able to come out here to the desert southwest. They were familiar with northern New Mexico, and they just really fell in love with this area. Well, in 1942, this plateau was picturesque, idyllic. There were 36 homesteads up here, so it was very sparsely populated. After an extensive search of the landscape he loved, Oppenheimer found the perfect place for the project, Los Alamos. Los Alamos itself was the site of a school for boys. Basically, you get a high school education, but it's kind of like the Boy Scouts. They issue a, you a rifle, a horse, and that's pretty much it. They wore shorts year-round, and it gets pretty cold up here in Los Alamos in the winter. They slept year-round outside in a screened-in porch of Fuller Lodge. And so the idea was to also toughen the boys up. That's what was going on here. And suddenly, in 1942 and 43, Army bulldozers come in. They start plowing down the trees. They start moving dirt. The Army puts up buildings just as fast as they can. And in a matter of months, in the opening months of 1943, they created the wartime laboratory here in Los Alamos. The Manhattan Project was moving swiftly forward. Hundreds of scientists and workers were installed in labs across the country. It works on paper. It became Oppenheimer's task to recruit the scientists to come to this isolated place in New Mexico and help him build um, a bomb. Groves and Oppenheimer originally thought that they would have probably about 30 scientists and maybe 100 support personnel on the project. But uh, it grew and grew and grew. And they ended up with over 6,000 people working on it by the end. Oppenheimer dubbed this collection of brilliant scientists his luminaries. At times, there were up to six Nobel Prize winners uh, working on the project. The scientists that I've talked to were amazed at the array of famous, Nobel-winning, amazing scientists. And when you talk like, to the SEDs who sometimes worked with them, they were saying, oh my god, you know, I'm 19, and, and Richard Feynman is asking me questions, or Edward Teller tells me I'm wrong. Edward Teller had joined the Manhattan Project from the beginning, but was annoyed at being passed over for the directorship of the theoretical division. A lot of these scientists were very difficult personalities, and this was recognized early on by both Groves and Oppenheimer. Uh, and Teller was probably the most difficult of them all. Edward Teller was a Hungarian, another emigre who had studied with Heisenberg, who was um, an irascible character. Fermi told me a long time ago that of all the people in the project, he thought Teller was the smartest. And I said, you know, I find that very hard because Edward has been so controversial and and their personalities were so different. You know, a Hungarian and a, a, an Italian, just so different. But uh, Fermi's favorite, authenticated by his daughter and by his telling media, was Teller. He was the, you know, the, the premier theoretician as far as he was concerned, so he was going to deal with bigger issues. So he refused to do the calculations. They were assigned to him by Oppenheimer. He refused to do them, ultimately, because they were critical to the working of the implosion bomb, that uh, those calculations were given to the British mission of scientists at Los Alamos, including Klaus Fuchs. So it was Klaus Fuchs who turned out to be a Soviet agent who actually did the theory of implosion calculations. And of course, he passed that information on to the Soviet Union. When Edward came here, I think that he had the expectation that he would be the leader of the theoretical physics division. And Oppenheimer had another choice, Hans Bethe. Hans Bethe was one of the first recruits. 
Born in Germany, he'd fled his home country in 1935. From very early on, Jews were uh, arrested and put in concentration camps. That was very simple. I had a Jewish mother, so I think there was no question that I should emigrate. Beta had been working on radar for the military, a project he felt was a far more practical use than working with a hastily assembled group on a nuclear bomb. I thought it couldn't possibly work, so this was a waste of time. But he had great respect for Oppenheimer. And I was simply curious, so when he asked me to come, I came. The work at Los Alamos was a race to beat the Germans to the bomb, a race to win the war. But Groves had no idea where he stood in that race. Groves was particularly driven by the lack of information that he had on Axis projects. He was obsessed with uh, finding out whether the Germans had a program, were working on a bomb, who the scientists were. From the beginning of the Manhattan Project, they had been trying to determine what the Germans were doing. And they didn't have hardly any information to go on. What were the Germans doing? We have to find out. Were they building a bomb or not? So Groves set about mining all of the information they had about whether or not the Germans might have a bomb, and even set up some special missions to attack and even assassinate key German scientists, the most famous of which was Werner Heisenberg. And they gave him um, a man called uh, Moberg, Morrisberg, who happened to also be a, a professional baseball player, a, a catcher. And uh, Moberg was quite a character. He was told, uh, we have a mission for you, he's told by Groves, to go to Europe and track Heisenberg, and if there is any indication that he knows anything about a bomb program, to kill him. So Berg is sent to Europe. Um, Heisenberg is given a special permission to leave Germany and go to Switzerland and give a lecture. And in the audience is Mo Berg. Heisenberg's right in front of him. He's got a gun in his pocket. He also has cyanide pills to kill himself if it comes to that. But again, this is wartime, this is a mission. I've signed up for it, this is what I do. He's in the audience and Heisenberg doesn't give any indication that he has anything to do with the bomb. Later that night, he gets invited to a dinner in which Heisenberg is one of the members of the party. And uh, again, he, he gets no indication from Heisenberg that there's a bomb program at work. He even gets to walk in the same street back to their quarters where they're staying with Heisenberg. So Heisenberg doesn't know this, of course, but he escapes with his life because Berg decides that he doesn't know anything about a bomb. So yes, Groves has uh, not only a project to maybe get rid of what is considered to be the top scientist, but to bomb their laboratory in Berlin to go after them um, in, in other places. And uh, it has, again, the authority to tell the Air Force, I want you to bomb this section of Berlin. These are the laboratories of what might be a German pro bomb program. Eighth Air Force, done. Finding out about Germany's progress was one thing, but it was equally important to prevent any leak of information from Los Alamos that might alert them to the Manhattan Project. Secrecy was absolutely vital. We could not tell our parents where we were, which was very hard on them because there were draft dodgers during those days, and the neighbors whose sons were all in the military one way or the other, they'd ask my parents, you know, where I was. And they, they honestly couldn't say. So I think it was very hard on them. You had limited communication with your family, with your loved ones, with the outside world. You were working under the pressure, the immense unceasing pressure of trying to get the job done. It was an intense time. We all worked, I think it would be fair to say, 60-hour weeks. And we worked on Saturday by rule, so to speak, by routine. Sunday was the only day off. Anybody working under those kind of conditions needs to blow off steam somehow. Even though there was an uh, immense pressure to build the weapon, and they went to uh, six-day and I think even seven-day work weeks, that there was some time for recreation. They could visit Santa Fe from time to time under certain conditions, 
And Groves, of course, had his spies out to ensure that these scientists, if they visited the bar in Santa Fe, were not too um, talkative. We were on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But uh, a group of us would get together, say, for a trip up to the hot springs, spend the day swimming. Before we left here early in the morning, we would make up a story that everybody would use as who we were and why we were there. And no mention of Los Alamos. The security was probably the most important thing that you were told when you were there in, at the outset. Uh, that this was a very highly secret project and you're not to talk to anybody, including your, your own spouse, about what you're doing here. One of the really difficult things about working in wartime Los Alamos was that you were in a confined space and you had limited movement. You couldn't just get up and go wherever you wanted. You, you had to have permission. There's a good chance that somebody might be watching you. All the scientists were given fake names, and Fermi's name was Mr. Farmer, I remember. General Groves was very cautious about security. And whenever, uh, especially the upper level scientists left the hill, then they would have um, security guards with them. Oppenheimer almost always had a bodyguard. And then the people from Los Alamos knew, you know, wherever they went, they were being followed. Uh, and it was, uh, it was just, you know, part of what you lived with. We weren't allowed phone calls coming in from outside. If we got one, they were to be transferred to uh, Dave Hawkins' office, who was the personnel department. They couldn't get any mail uh, in or out from uh, where they really were, so everybody had the same address, uh, Box 1663. Certain places like Sears Roebuck wondered, uh, you know, who was living on Box 1663 since they got, um, you know, 100 catalogs from uh, Sears and Roebuck. Somebody was reading your mail, and if there was something in there that shouldn't be in there, it was sent back to you for you to figure out what belonged and what didn't belong. Richard Feynman had, had sort of a unique situation. His wife had tuberculosis, and she was at a sanatorium in Albuquerque, and so they would write letters to each other, and they had a, a, a pet thing that they did, and that was they liked to write in code. Well, the mail in Los Alamos was censored, and the uh, folks who were taking care of the censorship of the mail were just up in arms. They didn't know what to do about this code because, for all they knew, Richard was telling all these secrets of Los Alamos to his, his ill wife in Albuquerque. They finally worked out a deal where the, um, whoever was writing the letter would include a key code for the censors, and then the censors had to throw that key code away so that the recipient of the letter would be able to break the code. Groves and the Army security people were worried about the fact that word was getting out that there was the secret facility. These scientists would come in from the Mesa, and uh, uh, so people in, Los, in Santa Fe knew that there was something going on at, uh, at Los Alamos. One of the rumors that actually had some basis in fact was that it was a base for pregnant wax, members of the Women's Army Corps. There were stories such as uh, it was a repair uh, center for submarines. But Dr. Oppenheimer got very concerned about all these rumors going on in Santa Fe. So the, the scientists were sent into the bar at La Fonda to, uh, <laughs> to sort of tell false stories, to spread disinformation. He called in Charlotte Serber, who was the librarian, and Robert Serber, and he said, I want you all to go down to Santa Fe. I want you to go to the La Fonda, I want you to pretend to get drunk, and I want you to spread a rumor. One of the stories they were supposed to tell is that they were working on electric rockets. Oh, do you know what they're doing in Los Alamos? They're making rockets up there. And Charlotte would dance with somebody or she'd sit at the bar with somebody and, and you know, they wanted to talk about their cow or their ranch or their different problems. They didn't really care what was going on in Los Alamos. Oppenheimer's leadership was critical. He knew that keeping his team happy was essential if they were to succeed. He did his utmost to create a normal working environment. Groves and the Army did their best to, to uh, supply whatever was needed to keep some semblance of uh, normal life um, in place. We tried to make it normal. Well, it, it wasn't normal. We're way up there, and so there are a lot of things to do at this altitude in this part of the country. Scientists really enjoyed hiking. Enrico Fermi, in particular, was a legendary hiker around here. We had a scientist here. His name was George Kistiakowsky. He was the leader of our explosives division. So George had all of this high explosive composition B laying around, and it turns out that that's pretty good for clearing out trees. And so our first ski run was created by George Kistiakowsky and his high explosives. Hans Bethe, I think, was the key figure. He got the army to put a donkey engine on top of the hill there, and they fixed it up with a rope, so they had a rope tow. Sundays went on picnics, went to the mountains, went to the Indian Pueblo, went to the ruins, sometimes went even to Santa Fe if we could afford the gas. 
Many of the scientists and their families uh, enjoyed riding horses. Dottie's house was pretty, and so she would offer her house for weddings and for parties. One of the nice things about World War II Los Alamos for the scientists is that they could, if they were married, they could bring their wife, they could bring their family here to the site. So women in Los Alamos had many roles. There were obviously stay-at-home moms, there were women scientists who were up here. So many of the women also served as teachers and they, and they worked in the schools which were being built at the time. And then there were a lot of jobs that were created at the laboratory that women did. Of course there were secretarial jobs, there were Women's Army Corps people who were here that were telephone operators. There were many women who worked as computers. That was their title. They were known as computers themselves. They had big adding machines and they were crunching the numbers for the mathematics that would create the engineering that would create the bombs because there were no computers at the time to do this and so it was actually human computers was what the women were. There was an expression I think during the war that they also serve who only stand and wait and there was a lot of standing and waiting if you were a wife of one of the scientists at Los Alamos. Groves and his staff had planned for everything the community needed to sustain itself and work efficiently. But there was one thing he hadn't planned for, a baby boom. One of their favorite activities was having babies. There was a huge population of kids. It was a dollar to have a baby, and almost everybody had a baby. Groves was not too happy at the number of babies that were born at Los Alamos. Groves was concerned about the business of having to provide more and more housing. Groves actually told Oppenheimer uh, that he wanted the scientists to have fewer children. Of course, this was pretty tough for Oppenheimer to do, considering that Kitty Oppenheimer, his wife, was pregnant with a child uh, at the time, so he really didn't have uh, much moral authority to speak on the issue. Even a brothel appeared. Amazingly, Colonel Groves looked the other way. At Los Alamos, the Wax set up a little business for the men, and. Uh, they were doing pretty well in their little business enterprise, and General Groves, they found out about it, and then they said, look, pff, just we're just maybe going to look the other way and you know try to keep it a little less visible. The work at Los Alamos was incredibly dangerous. Dr. Harry Daglian fatally irradiated himself whilst performing a critical mass experiment. It was just one of the many accidents that took the lives of pioneering Los Alamos scientists working on the bomb. There were a lot of potential hazards. And so while they were aware of the hazards, they were still learning the nature of how significant some of these hazards would be. There was a physicist named Harry Dalian. He wanted to do a criticality experiment. He went down to one of our facilities. It was later in the evening. He was, he was by himself to do the experiment at least. And what he did was he took some plutonium and he started stacking these tungsten carbide bricks around it. And so with every tungsten carbide brick that he would place around it, it would contain more neutrons. So with every brick you're getting closer to going prompt critical. He comes down to his last brick, drops it, lands on the pile. It's enough to contain enough neutrons for it to go prompt critical and he instantly receives a fatal dose of radi radiation. And it was really a terrible way to die because uh, what happens is over the course of several days, 10 to 20 days, your body just breaks down completely. There was the unfortunate Sloten accident Louis Sloten, who was demonstrating how you could bring two pieces of plutonium together. It was a sphere, and so you had to keep the two hemispheres apart. If they came together, it would contain enough neutrons, again, to go prompt critical. The way that they kept the hemispheres apart was with a screwdriver. And so Louis Sloten was holding a screwdriver between the hemispheres. The screwdriver slipped, the hemispheres came together, and it went prompt critical and there was a, a burst of radiation that uh, was fatal to Sloten and, and, uh, uh, and others in the room. I remember they had gotten lead foil to put in his mouth because his, the gold of his, in his teeth, the fillings were radioactive. And you, you, you know, you, you got glimpses of what was going on. It was very sobering. The danger extended beyond the science labs. A lack of knowledge among security staff also resulted in deaths. We had some soldiers. They drank a substance thinking that it was consumable alcohol. Turned out that it was not, and they all three died as a result of ingesting uh, 
whatever this, this was that they took. The theory of the nuclear chain reaction was well developed by this point. The problem was now an engineering challenge. How would the new bomb actually work? Then disaster struck. The thin man bomb design they had been working on was fatally flawed. Probably the most serious problem that they faced during the Manhattan Project was the realization in 1944 that maybe the plutonium that was being made in reactors at Hanford, Washington would not work in the design, in the bomb design. Disaster really struck because we found out that the plutonium did have this isotope plutonium-240 and uh, couldn't use a gun. And all the material we were going to get primarily in the early days was plutonium. And just at the time this knowledge uh, came to everybody's attention and they realized that, um, wow, we have a serious, serious problem, a solution was at hand. And that solution, of course, became what is known as implosion. A visitor from outside who was present in the meeting, namely Johnny Van Neumann, who pointed out that, in fact, if you imploded them with sufficient symmetry, you could get a great increase in density, which meant you could get away with using much, much less material. Immediately, the work shifted from the concept of using plutonium in a gun to plutonium in a, what turned out to be an implosion using high explosive. And it was far from certain that the implosion bomb would work, unless the detonators went off exactly right. And so it was new, and it was exciting, and it was hard, and it was, uh, you know, discovering things, but at the same time working 12 and 14 hours a day, trying to reach that goal. Scientists uh, didn't obsess about uh, the destructiveness of this thing, of this thing they were building for a couple of reasons. One is that the war was going on. Um, they, they knew of the terrible casualties, certainly the war in the Pacific. From what I knew about the war, it sounded like things weren't really going that well. There seemed no end to what was going on. And the other aspect is they didn't really understand how terrible this weapon was yet. It hadn't been tested. It was all theoretical. Their standards of judgment were, uh, you know, comparable weapons were the two-ton blockbuster. Well, the weapon they're building is not a blockbuster, it's a city buster. General Groves was pressing for a test. The war in Europe was over, and he wanted to have the weapon available before the end of the Potsdam Conference. And Groves set about, uh, where are we going to do it? And they found a place in uh, New Mexico in the desert, and they called it the Trinity Site. Groves began preparations for the world's first ever test of a nuclear weapon. But would it work? Simultaneously, uh, Harry Truman is in Potsdam, Germany, uh, with his counterparts, uh, Churchill and Stalin. News of this uh, success or failure is going to have an impact. The pressure in the days leading up to the Trinity test took its toll. Oppenheimer was sickly and exhausted and a weakened, distracted leader had a direct effect on everyone around him. Well, extraordinary. I mean, very hard to sleep, very hard to get your minds off all the things that might have gone wrong, very hard not to think about the implications. But, you know, we, all, we were consuming the job, especially this crucial one, a test fire to see if this whole idea would work. And that was uh, in everyone's mind, I think. Fear of failure, problems with the implosion device, even weather, added to the strain and pressure on the assembled scientists, military and staff. The weather's a problem. Oh my God, the thunderstorms and the rain and lightning. And finally, Grove says, we're going at dawn. We're going to have the bomb test, period. Some scientists had grave concerns about the gadget's enormous power. As the countdown began, they feared the bomb could ignite the atmosphere. Groves is there with uh, Vannevar Bush and his counterpart, uh, James Conant who's the president of Harvard. The three of them are huddled together, and it goes through uh, Conant's mind that maybe the predictions about uh, what might happen if there's an atomic explosion might come to pass here, and it might ignite the atmosphere. Oppenheimer's brother, Frank, had been camped out at the Trinity site. They prepared for disaster. We were located 10 miles from the explosion, or a little more. It was not the closest group. It was next to the closest. And we were told to lie down with our backs to the explosion. 
the critical moment had arrived. Oppenheimer made a final solo trip to the site. He climbed the tower and personally checked the gadget. No one knew what would happen next. There was a, a pool made of what the uh, magnitude of the shot should be. I bet on the number that Rarita had predicted, namely eight kilotons. I guessed that it was a number too, something like 5,000. Beta calculated that no, the Earth was safe by uh, several orders of magnitude. Fermi stood up and, and I watched him, I knew he was going to do this. He was only 20 or 30 feet away. And he began dropping those piece, famous pieces of paper. So we all watched to see how far they would move. And when the blast wave hit several seconds later, he was able to measure the distance that the paper had been blown by the blast wave and to come up with a rough calculation of the yield. There was tremendous uncertainty. Uh, I bet I was the only one who lost the pool because I bet too high. Rabi won the pool and then later said he bet relatively high out of courtesy. Robbie was really getting quite excited, you know, what's going to happen. And Gryson was very relaxed. Uh, Robbie said, uh, gee, aren't you going to get excited? He said, no, he's calm. If you've been doing a lot of work with explosives, you get fairly calm, I guess you have to. And he was fairly uh, calm. And Robbie said, well, you tell me when you get excited. And we went, oh, finally the countdown went down to, you know, minus a minute minus 30 seconds, minus 15 seconds, minus 15 seconds, Gryson nudged Robbie and said, I'm excited. I had goggles and sunglasses and cardboard and two or three different things to pick up. I was at base camp and I actually was the person with a microphone and a short wave set listening to the people reporting and I was supposed to read out the countdown, which I remember repeating when I heard McKibben and I think it was uh, into the microphone saying, we're now getting this ready, it's turning on the timer. Now it's an automatic and I'll count with it. And I started to pick up that count. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. The test was a triumph. On July the 16th, 1945, the world's first nuclear bomb was successfully detonated. But it was almost immediately followed by sober reflection on what they had created. And the bomb goes off as scheduled. Um, and it has quite an impact on everyone. Groves ordered everybody who witnessed the, the bomb test at Trinity to give a written account. And Lawrence said he was looking down, and, but he could see out of the edge of his eye the fireball and that the whole desert was suddenly as bright as day. As though the sun had suddenly risen. And then, you know, the same moment, but I couldn't see it that fast, the light came. The light shone all around. I could see in peripheral vision quite well, but I couldn't see the direct light for half a second or so. And that was the thing, actually, that I think stunned the scientists the most, the most, was the light from the bomb. And so the notion that it was in some way, in the most elementary human way, competitive with the full sun, that was the time that I got the sense of the power of the bomb more than anything else. As I looked down at the sand, it was like you were lifting the curtain in a darkened room and the bright light coming in. Now, then I was impressed. But the shock wave was amazing at 10 miles away. It wasn't just noticeable. It would knock you down, even at that distance. That was a very, very impressive thing to see that coming across the desert. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really moving across at an incredible speed. You see this dust, this ring of dust coming in, and all of a sudden, wobble. I did not care to see literally what would kill people. I knew it would help end the war, but it would cost a lot of lives in the procedure. And so I did not go. I didn't want to see it. The most important memory of the entire experience is before I got my hand up to start adjusting the goggles, I felt something that I didn't know. I hadn't been smart enough to interpret to figure out what was going to happen, and nobody had thought of it, I think. It was a cool, desert morning. The sun had not quite come up. The air was still. It had that curious chill of a hot place, which is its, its coolest hour of the day. And suddenly, on that cold background, the heat of the sun came to me 
before the sun rose. It was the heat of the bomb, not the light, but the heat was the first thing that I could feel. Uh, Jack Abbey, incidentally, he is the person that took that shot of the test bomb. I knew uh, when the uh, detonation was to take place, and at that time I carried a chair up the road out away from the base camp. When the uh, detonation finally occurred, it was easy to assume right quick that that was not going to be a fizzle. And then I just shot four pictures in a row. I would have taken more, except I ran out of film. People assumed that Oppenheimer had immediate guilt feelings after the Trinity test when he recognized the dimensions of the destructiveness of this weapon. That's not the case. That um, Actually, I asked his brother, Frank Oppenheimer, uh, who was lying next to Robert Oppenheimer in the sand when the bomb was tested at Trinity. I said, what did your brother say when it went off? And Frank said he wished he could remember the exact words, but it was to the effect of it worked. Everybody cheered for a while, and then it was kind of quiet. Well, a mixture of elation and, and uh, awe. As I was saying, like feeling the heat on your face changes in a moment all the attitudes you might have. No longer a commonplace thing. Robbie is the one who said uh, when the bomb went off, he could feel the heat, and even in, in that situation of feeling the heat, that he got goosebumps. He recognized immediately that the world had changed. And the most interesting thing about that was the uh, collapse of security in the, the dining halls that evening, because everyone was exchanging experiences about the explosion, where they saw it from, what it was, and so on. Not just a few people, but a, a roar of such discussion. I think everybody after the test felt he had made history. And we were quite aware this would change world history from now on. When the uh, tests down in the southern part of the state were successful, that, that felt good. We could see the end of the war in sight. There was the other scientist, Bainbridge, who made the comment uh, to Oppenheimer, I think, that now we're all sons of bitches. We knew the world would not be the same. A few people laughed. A few people cried. Most people were silent. Now it was going to be used on Japan. Uh, there's no doubt about it. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty. And to impress him, takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. Groves prepared his report on Trinity for the Secretary of War. At 05.30, 16th of July 1945, in a remote section of the Alamogordo Air Base, New Mexico, the first four-scale test was made of the implosion-type atomic fission bomb. For the first time in history, there was a nuclear explosion. And what an explosion. The test was successful beyond the most optimistic expectations of anyone. But amongst the euphoria, a new problem was emerging. Just two months earlier, defeating Hitler had been the scientists' goal. It was the reason they had come to Los Alamos. Our initial motivation for this project in the first place was to beat Hitler to the bomb. He's been defeated. So now Japan is essentially standing alone in World War II. Not all of the scientists working on the Manhattan Project supported using nuclear weapons against Japan. For the Europeans amongst them, the threat from faraway Japan seemed minimal. Confronted with the awesome power of the weapon they'd created, the morality of using it came into sharper focus. There was a very real worry that some scientists would quit. You have to realize it was already past VE Day, so it obviously wasn't something that would be used in Europe. The amount of information we had with respect to the progress of the war was as limited as the newsreels that came out. 
And so you still had no idea how these things might be used. For the Americans on the team, the shock and horror of Pearl Harbor was still fresh and painful. I had lost a lot of friends during the early parts of the war. Uh, high school friends, college friends, most of them in the Pacific. I was on a softball team. I was a pitcher. The catcher, whose name was Howard Erickson, he was killed in the Pacific. So there was a certain personal rage against the Japanese. During the war, we forget how anti-Japanese the Americans were. If you go back and look, I'll never forget, I found an article in Time Magazine one time, right after Pearl Harbor, and it talked about how you could tell the difference between the Chinese and the Japanese, and how Chinese are sweet and honest and good, and Japanese are furative and, and you know mean, and, and that's how you can tell the differences, and they went through and, and talked physically how you could tell the differences. And it was, it was very startling to someone who's living in this time period to see something like that. Because of humanity's way of doing things, it was a necessity to put a stop to the major amount of killing, which would have happened if we had to invade Japan. There would have been millions killed that otherwise weren't because of the bomb. No, I thought that was great. Anything to end the war. I think most of the scientists supported using the nuclear weapons to, to bring the, the war to an end as quickly as possible. But there were some who thought that the bombs were not necessary. The recognition came home that this really had changed the world and that this was going to be, it was going to be a different world after, after this weapon was tested and, and worked. There were scientists who argued that rather than use this weapon against a city to kill civilians, that it, we should demonstrate it like Leo Szilard, who's in Chicago. And he had circulated a petition that the bomb should not be dropped before the Japanese were first notified. Will I please sign it and circulate it in Los Alamos? I wanted to sign it, but I felt I could not circulate it without showing it to Oppenheimer. That I did. And Oppenheimer got very excited. That is completely wrong. We scientists have one job, to solve the technical problems. We don't know anything about the Japanese. We don't know anything about politics. We should shut up about all those things. Once the decision had been made to use the gadget, how would the bomb be delivered? Tinian Island was the staging post for the planned invasion of Japan. From here, the next step was to work out how to actually drop the bomb. Well, Tinian was a remarkable place. It was the chief base of the 20th Air Force, 21st Bomber Command. The B-29 attack on Japan was carried out mostly from Tinian. And Tinian then was said to be the largest airfield in the world, I think it was. It had three or four, two or three mile runways running the whole length of the island nearly. And uh, 50 or 60,000 people. Before Hiroshima, our group, 509th Composite Group, was pretty clearly regarded with suspicion by the rest because we never did anything. And we never got any big supply of materials. You understand, huge amounts of gasoline flowed into that island and huge amounts of bombs. Well, they could see that we didn't get any of those. So what's going on here? Here's this airplane, they go out, they train, they do, but they don't do much and they don't get our ordnance. We were doing a lot of testing there to give the crew combat experience. We're being dropped fairly regularly by the 509th. In fact, we had a, a problem that it caused. Uh, the first one of those that was dropped, a dropping mechanism, it turned out, particularly the Fat Man model, was heavier than anything that the U.S. Air Force had dropped and their bomb release mechanism that the Air Force designed didn't work. The first Fat Man model, uh, when it fell down, head over heel. And in fact, uh, I guess I officially have an invention for a drag plate. Now they had worked out how to drop the bomb, the question was, where? People mistakenly assumed that there was a directive that said, you know, bomb Hiroshima first and then bomb Nagasaki second. Actually, the order from Truman was that the bombs, bombs plural, should be used as soon as they are ready. And there was a target list that had been worked out in advance. Hiroshima obviously was top of the list, and one reason being that it is somewhat on a flat train surrounded by high hills, so that as Grove said, that it would contain, the, the bomb was set up at 1,800 feet, it was an airburst 
but the fireball would basically not touch the ground, but it, the effects of the bomb, the explosion, would, would spread out, as he said, and cause more physical destruction. If they do not now accept our terms, they may expect a rain of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. It had taken a thousand days to get here. Another kind of D-Day. Decision day. Would America, could America drop the bomb? What would be the outcome? For the war, for science, for humanity? They did not know any other way to um, use the weapon effectively than to actually drop it. I guess one of the fears was what was going to happen to us when the bomb went off, because we had no idea what the yield was going to be in a little boy. We dropped three gauges on parachutes. Japanese thought the bombs were on parachutes, but they weren't. It was our gauges. We measured the blast pressure and telemetered it back to the receivers we had in the back bomb bay and the great artiste, which was our instrument plane. There's an instrument plane, there's a photo plane, and there's a weapon-carrying plane. But they developed this canister with diagnostic equipment that could be parachuted in behind the atomic bombs and take basic measurements of the blast. And so that was what Harold did during the war. He also had the foresight to video or to, to film and to photograph the atomic bombs. bomb went off. It was a big flash. It, and we only had about a six-inch window, which is what I took some movies out of. But about a second or two later, we got slapped with the blast wave, which really shook us up. And then we got, maybe two seconds later, we got another slap, which had us puzzled. And then we realized that was the reflection from the ground, because it had been detonated at about 1,800 feet. And so the photographs that we see of the attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we have those in no small part, thanks to Harold Agnew. Louis, again, the more I think about it, he, he was the most inventive person. He knew, after the first drop, he knew a physicist in Japan, and he wrote a long letter to this physicist. As scientists, we deplore the use to which a beautiful discovery has been put. But we can assure you that unless Japan surrenders at once, this rain of atomic bombs will increase many fold in fury. Scotch taped them to our canisters, and then uh, when we dropped our instrument gauges, the canisters were picked up, and presumably the letters were delivered to this particular Japanese physicist. It may have an effect uh, on the emperor's decision. They had a little radio station, KRS. Uh, which was just within Los Alamos. After, it must have been the Enola Gay, they broadcast what is a wire, not a tape, of that drop. And so you hear the engine, I remember this real well, the engine of the plane, roar, roar, roar. And then they start the countdown, you know, 10, 9, 8. All I wrote down in my notebook is that it really went off, it really did. That's all I wrote. When they landed, there was a phalanx of brass there all the commanding officers that could get their own air transport from anywhere in the Pacific were there. And when that crew brought the plane to a stop, of course, in front of a delegation of reception officers, they jumped out of the plane, and as they hit the ground, straightened up spots who, I think, was the senior general, pinned the Air Force Medal on each one as his feet, so to speak, hit the rubble. Now, I think it is. it was a surprise to everyone that the bomb was as effective as it was. The immediate reaction in Los Alamos after the first bomb was dropped on Hiroshima was one of elation. It was elation because, first of all, their work had, had paid off. They had done what they had, had set out to do. Even after the near-total destruction of Hiroshima, the Japanese refused to surrender. And soon after, a second atomic bomb, the Fat Man, was dropped on Nagasaki. 
Nikata and Kokura were also on the list. I think they were the primary, which was the primary target for Box Car, which was the um, carried the second bomb. But because of weather conditions, the the bomb was carried to Nagasaki, which was the tertiary target. And I think the target was meant to be the Mitsubishi uh, aircraft engine manufacturing facility. I asked. Norris, well, you know, could you have had a test? And he said, with the second bomb, he said, in the first place, we weren't really sure it was going to work. If we had announced a test on an island or something, we were afraid the Japanese might have moved the American prisoners of war to that island. Beyond the Nagasaki bomb, there was another bomb ready to go within 10 or 12 days, and a bomb after that, and a bomb after that. The celebration at the gadget's success and the war's end quickly turned to contemplation and fear. What had they done? What would it mean for the future? The question was asked over and over. Should we have used the bomb? And, and it's very, very mixed. At the end, after the war is over, you have a group of scientists who just thought, I can't believe I did this. I should not have worked on it. Einstein uh, said he regretted writing his, his letter to President Roosevelt that got the whole project started in the first place. And, and so there was this group of people that thought, we have created this monster, it's just awful, we should, never should have done it. I at once had a strong feeling of regret, not of having made the bomb, but of not having signed the petition to show it before it was used. It was not only justified, but necessary. It was so overwhelming that the emperor, Hirohito, had to step in and say, Enough is enough. The creed as far as the Japanese military was no surrender. It wasn't in their dictionary. But fortunately, he um, realized that he should just overrule his military who wanted to continue strictly for honor and surrendered. Saved a lot of their lives and certainly a lot of ours. The whole objective was to end the war. And we succeeded. My feeling was, and still is, that the war in Japan would have gone on in a horrible fashion for a long time with great loss of life on both sides because of the nature of the, the war as it had been fought in the islands um, up to that time. This is something you'll never know. There's no way of telling how long the war would have gone if it hadn't been the bomb. In my opinion, Millions of Japanese would have died if we hadn't used the bomb. So I believe that uh, in this particular case, the bomb saved lives. 